the elements of this philosophy surround us. At their core, these are classical elements. It's fallacy to say that this process removes all aesthetic feature. The goal is scalability and efficiency, but not the limit. I take the position that DFM, or Design for Manufacture, has and will continue to be the standard. Yes, it inhibits the purely aesthetic. These limits regularly convert a design into simplistic beauty. The perception is that parts made with DFM concepts at heart lack traditional aesthetic. If you look carefully, this is not the case. There's an interesting aspect to milling and fitting these parts. They feature a design intent well ahead of their time. Whether you consider it positive or negative, it changed the way we produce instruments. This style of bolt-on neck, a standard today, implements DFM concepts. We do not have to mass produce them to borrow these design elements. We are free to adapt and change these forms to our means and methods. This approach provides ease in manufacturing and enhanced functionality to the user. This 1950s adaptation is an early representation of what we call DFM today. While my goal is not to mass produce, I can still appreciate how these design limits influence and integrate these limiting factors into my work in a way that reveals an unassuming style. DFM may seem to go hand in hand with CNC operation. This is not always the case. I typically determine my order of operations from traditional methods. While I do experiment with these design elements, I find many preconceived notions through time have resulted in an incredibly consistent process. Reliable results come from a light hand when modifying this status quo. My method begins with thickness sanding the fretboard blanks to a quarter of an inch. For clean inlay, I cut the pockets and glue in the material, milling the fretboard radius through the blank and inlay material together. I'm using a three quarter inch ball nose mill for this on a 60,000 step over scallop toolpath. The large diameter of the bit, coupled with a small step over, carve a smooth contour that requires little sanding. I use the tool marks as indicators while sanding, leaving an accurate representation of the 3D model, even with compound radiuses. I mill the fret slots with a 24 thousandths inch bit trace operation that follows the radius, cutting a contoured slot. The outline is the last operation, cut with a quarter inch bit in a 1 16th inch pass with 60,000 stock to leave. The last finishing operation is two 30 thousandths passes at 1 8 inch depth with a little stock to leave. This extra material allows me to shape the final outline with the parts attached. Why do I use this finishing strategy? The machine is more than capable enough to cut this outline in a single pass. I continually think about tool load. I don't use expensive tooling and I can get the most out of it by paying close attention. The primary pass is at full engagement. On finishing passes, the tool load is engaging the material lightly and consistently. It's not about a perfect surface finish. I work these shapes by hand after I join them. I want the outlines to be accurate so that I can use these faces as indicators, making my hand finished parts as true as possible. I'm not trying to make this part perfect with the machine alone. This is the biggest misconception about CNC work. I enjoy the handwork that goes into building instruments. The details tell the story, and the details are not machine made. There's an artistry in the design process 
the toolpath selection, and the fine finish work. The machine replaces none of these. I adapted these methods and order of operations to suit my set of skills and tooling. At their core, these elements are not much different from the way they were performed on those hot summer days in the early 1950s. I feel like this spirit of invention is intrinsic to the artistry of Luthery work. While this adaptation is bold and striking, it's not different from utilizing violin internal molds or Amati's original violin family patterns that were DFM techniques developed in the 1500s. This concept is not new. It's as old as the first toolmaker. Finish sanding the fretboard goes quickly. The sanding block is there to hold the radius as it removes the tool marks. There are small pieces of material that need to be removed manually with the fretting saw. I also want to ensure that the slot depth is enough the fret will go in unobstructed. This is a meditative process. It's incredibly calming. The work becomes sedative. It can be anesthetic. I enjoy listening to a book while fretting, flattening, beveling, and recrowning frets. The work and the results are equally satisfying. I have some unusual ideas for applying DFM techniques to this method, but that's for another day. Fretting is straightforward. I clean the fret wire with acetone, bend the radius, cut to length and tap in. I follow up with little CA glue wicked into each fret end to grip them at the ends and fill the small air gap. Then file the fret ends down to match the edge of the fretboard. I could have milled these parts much closer to their final shape. I leave just enough to coax the form by hand, slowly easing the transitions until they seem flawless. This is tactile work. The folks not in the know think this is missing from CNC production. Handwork is incredibly satisfying done this way. No heavy removal, no sore hands and joints, just luthier and tool finding the shape in the stock, not deep within, but lingering slightly under the cut contours. I use laser cut files. They swiftly remove the skim of material. These tools are capable of deep cuts and precise removal. They carve a clean, plain-like chip that leaves a smooth surface with subtle tool markings. The final sanding goes quickly. The last step is to shape the fretboard scoop to match the headstock. I do this carefully with the drum sander. While the speed and efficiency in no way parallel mass production, it's no less satisfying to make them one at a time. DFM has changed the world. It does not prevent us from using these shapes and concepts on our own accord. This endless cycle of reinvention is on to its next turn, with or without us. This exploration drives us as makers, not to produce, but to find solutions. I enjoy this ride and I'll do my best to hang on as long as possible. Thanks for watching. Thank you.